Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Daphne, what's going on? Nothing much. Um, literally just got back from a conference um, for my sorority in St. Louis. It was our regional conference. So I got to spend some time with my sorority sisters and, you know, it was just a really good weekend. So I, I had fun. Uh, what's been going on with you? Nothing much. Um, just the usual counting down, you know, getting ready for the end of the semester, like three, four weeks left. <laughs> you know, so just grind time for everyone when it gets to the end of the semester and trying to graduate, all that stuff. <laughs> is, is it crazy to you that it is like about to be the middle of April? Like, I feel like it was just January and like it was literally just February when we launched this. Like yeah. the year is passing by really quickly. It is. And we st- still had snow up here the other day <laughs> in April. So it's kind of yeah. crazy. Yeah, it was potentially supposed to snow, but thank God it, you know, passed us. But that's mm-hmm. crazy. I want to give a quick shout out too to my brother, uh, Andre. He just turned 25, quarter century, oh, uh, April 8th. So, yeah, so he's getting old up there in age now, which makes me feel older, too, because he's the youngest. He's the baby of the bunch. So uh, Y'all getting older us. and I'm, <laughs> I'm just getting younger mm-hmm. every year, every year. <laughs> Aging like wine, like they say, right? Mm-hmm. Aging uh, like wine. Not like milk. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> not with all this melanin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too funny. Um, uh, so, yeah, to our listeners, we uh, we started this last, last week with Daphne with the kind of wacky news segment. And we thought that we want to make this a regular segment on our show. We call it the Old Lord News Segment. <laughs> where we oh, just present wow. a couple, a couple, uh, you know, stories that we feel like are really just wacky and out of out of the norm, um, and then share with you all to kind of break the ice a little bit. So we'll premiere the intro right now to this, and this is how we'll start the news segment every week. So check it out. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old lore news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say. <laughs> That's a bop tie. That is it definitely. Is. I would listen to that. that. I want to. I got it from um, a guy on Instagram remix, uh, Suede God, something along those lines, who remixed it and has his old Lord challenge going um, from the little kid that was (laughs) yodeling in Walmart. (laughs) Uh, Well, speaking of that, you you got any news that'll make us say, oh, Lord? Yeah, uh, I recently ran into this story. Okay, we've been having a lot of conversations in the nation about gun control, et cetera. And, you know, when you're a part of a sports team um, like, you know, a baseball team, and it's typical that you would do things like sell raffle tickets for a fundraiser. Well, this particular third grade baseball team in Missouri is doing the usual thing is selling a raffle tickets to raise money for their team, about five dollars for each raffle ticket. And the thing is, is that the winner of the raffle will receive an AR-15. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. assault rifle that has been used in many of the mass shootings we've been seeing. Of course, there's been a lot of blowback about it, but the coach and the, t- and the school says they're not going to change their position on this and they're trying to use this and spin it into a positive lens, which is kind of ridiculous. But for us, we just say <laughs> that's definitely a... Because <laughs> that's a crazy situation. Yeah, oh Lord, and I roll and how insensitive could you be? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Lord. Um, Well, this one is uh, 
you know, PSA and announcement to people, be careful with doing those DNA tests. So you know how you can send your kit into Ancestry.com or 23andMe and figure out where you're from, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you come from Africa, you know, whether you have some, you know, Western, like European or Asian in your blood, Mm -hmm. Or Indian in in your family, because, you know, a lot of black people say that they got Indian name family. (laughs) But you got to be careful with that, because in 2017, last year, there was this woman who decided to have a ancestry DNA test. And uh, once she got her results. So with these tests, they usually um, you can sign into the system and they will connect you with people who are supposedly, you know, potentially like distant relatives and things of that nature. So she signs in once she gets her uh, results and she gets an alert that there is someone whose DNA matches so closely to her that they could be a biological parent. What? Mind you that the person who popped up for her was not her daddy. (gasps) So, (laughs) yes. And so, you know, I... She ends up finding her birth certificate and the man who matched with her on the DNA test was the man who delivered her. It was her uh, OBGYN. It was the OBGYN. You know, she talks to her parents about it and they find out like so they the parents had gotten artificial insemination like back in the 70s mm-hmm. and they had never told their daughter. And the doctor in use his own sperm oh my on this goodness. woman without their knowledge. Oh my God. So this girl, this woman was born in the seventies and finds out that years later, you know, the doctor who delivered her is actually her dad. Oh um, and so she's suing. Of course. Um, of course. But that's crazy. <laughs> that's the real. That's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I got one more. One more old little story. This one is a little old, uh, came out a couple months ago, but I think it's important to people who are around my age, because if you're around my age, you grew up knowing, you know, Barney, the dinosaur, you know, I love you, you love me. You love me. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently um, the actor who played Barney, you know, black man by the name of David Joyner is now a tantric sex healer. Okay. Uh, he charges uh, female clients $350 for three hours, three to four hours for a ritual bath, chakra balancing and massage that can lead to what he says, mind blowing orgasms. Uh, <laughs> that's like, oh, Lord, and gross. Like, I wonder if he use the Barney voice. Oh, my like, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I remember growing up and people was like, mm, something ain't right about Barney. Like, I remember people like, you know, being like, mm, it might, something might be off about him. Yeah. So hearing that, it's kind of like, so mm, I don't I'll know. I'll never be able to look at Barney the same after hearing what he's into now. I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, but speaking of, I guess, entertainment, mm-hmm. Um, or things that people have been looking at. Did you watch Saturday Night Live uh, last night? I seen, I, I was tuning on and off, seeing the clips because, you know, I know my God T'Challa was on there. Yes. <laughs> and and then, of course, Cardi B as well. So I, I was definitely paying attention to what was going on with that. Did you, you catch some of it? I did. Well, I usually, if I... If I watch Saturday Night Live, I'll just look at the clips on either Hulu or YouTube like the day after to like look at the highlights. So I saw her performance where she, mm-hmm. of course, finally revealed her, you know, baby bump, huge baby bump. Yes. Um, I don't know why Super. she was hiding it, though. Mm. Everybody knew. Everybody, Everybody knew. knew. Congrats. You know, it's, I know it's freeing for her to come out and say that she's pregnant. And Cardi B also dropped uh, her debut album, Invasion yes. of Privacy. Did you did you listen to it at all yet? I haven't because like I said, I've been, you know, busy and traveling and stuff, but I did like her performance. I don't know the Be Careful song. Like, I like the way she mixed it on Saturday Night Live. I don't Mm -hmm. know if it's like that on the album, but that was really cool. Um, The album's pretty good. Uh, I've listened to it a couple of times through already. Um, I think her first track on there, Get Up 10, is really good. Kind of gives me that Meek Mill vibes as far as like the intro. I like the song with Chance the Rapper. Best Life is really good. 
Um, the song everybody on Instagram been dancing to, I like it, and like Diddy and all these other people, because um, mm-hmm. she kind of reading it. It's like, I like it like that. So that's pretty fun. So she got, it's pretty good, pretty good for her debut album, already gold because of gold at Bodak Yellow, uh, already gold as the first day, breaking records still. I just have a question though. What do you think of people, I mean, comparing her and, well, yeah, I've seen online people comparing her, maybe her trajectory to like Lauren Hills. What do you, have you heard that? Well, yeah, people have been doing that also recently because when she announced her pregnancy, there's been a lot of debate about that because they're like, oh, how can you be pregnant when your career is at at its peak? And, you know, that's also important because like gendering women, as far as like, when can you be pregnant? When can you have a baby? When is the right time? And trying to dictate to her, you know, what she should be doing professionally. But I've seen the comparisons because people have been comparison to Lauren Hill, who was also pregnant during her first, her debut album too. Um, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and you know, breaking all these kind of records. Um, you know, I feel like, I you know, they're two different artists, but I feel like what Lauren Hill was doing at that time, Cardi B, it's just her time, this particular audience, this particular generation. It's she, she may be something like that, right? Who knows? Only time to tell. But, you know, her impact has definitely been massive for sure. Uh, yeah, she, we haven't seen, you know, a female artist uh, have this type of impact, I think, since Nicki Minaj. Like, she's the first one that's, you know, risen since mm-hmm. Nicki Minaj. So this is interesting to, like, you know, see switching up, you know, switching up of the van, of the guard a little mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was also cool to see T'Challa uh, chat yeah, with T'challa. Bozeman <laughs> on the screen um, and just seeing like all the roles he's played. So like, you know, thinking about his monologue, how he's talked about he's played like Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall. Um, who else did he play? Oh, J- uh, James Brown mm-hmm. um, and all those things. And, and you know, just seeing him on the screen that I thought that was really cool. Um, I think he's a cool person in general, but it had me like thinking about like representation of like black men in the media and on TV. And I was just wondering because like I said, I felt this way with uh, Black Panther and thinking about Shuri and thinking about the different types of identities that black women have on TV. And I was just kind of wondering, like thinking about who you are as a black PhD, a black man, do you feel represented in the media? Like, do you feel that who you are and what you embody is yeah, represented on the big screen or the uh, small screen. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I think recently within these past few years, 100 uh, percent, I think, you know, when I think about just my life, my 30 years of living. Um, I feel like there was a big gap when there was just nothing, you know, just the traditional as far as black males, either athlete role representation or, you know, gangbanger type of role, um, you know, drug deal, et cetera. And really nothing in between as far as people representing the kind of community I'm a part of, you know, being academic or, you know, being in school, whether it's a lawyer, doctors just wasn't really present. And now we're beginning to see a lot more of that. And so I'm very happy up to see that. And I'm an adult now, so it still makes me to feel good, but I'm also worry like will it be long lasting right will my children be able to see these images is my hope uh because i think that's when it's kind of most important because it kind of sucks that i feel like i kind of went through life without seeing much of it uh and i just want my kids to see all of what's going on now i hope it just sustains that they can see all the different variations of, of black male identity uh what we're currently seeing today Yeah, um, I agree. And I think the key to that is keeping black men and black women in front of the scenes and behind the scene and behind the scenes to make sure that different identities and complexities are represented in a way that, like you said, you didn't have growing up and I didn't necessarily see growing up. I like you said, I, I saw certain things in terms of how black men were represented. It was kind of like, this is what we expect. This is what we see and we know. And it's just interesting how that creates a narrative for people who might not have everyday experiences with black men or black women and what black people 
eventually come to represent uh, based on what they see on TV and not necessarily based on interaction. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, Mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to know that. Yeah. And I th- that made me think about today's conversation, you know, and think and seeing Chadwick on the screen last night. Yeah. And I just ran, I stumbled upon a fact about Chadwick, too, that he's never been paid over a million dollars for any of the roles he's done. Are you well. serious? Are you serious? Yeah. And all the roles, he's never been paid over a million dollars. Well, honey, I hope he can renegotiate that uh, Marvel thing. <laughs> oh, well, that's definitely next Black Panther movie. He's definitely, come on, you bringing over a billion dollars. They got to give him a nice chunk of change. Yes. Just like they get everybody who play, you know, Tony Stark and Captain America. Give this, get this man his money. Yeah. Um, mm. But yeah, talking about representation and stuff like that, you know, there's been a lot. Um, today's conversation, we'll be talking with Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, who is a professor at Duke and who specializes in somewhat a lot of African-American studies, but in, in the area of hip hop and having discourse around that and what that means to, you know, black folk culturally, mainly focusing on the identities of black males and how that's portrayed. And in his book that we cover um, in this conversation, Looking for Leroy, we'll cover that in the conversation, discuss a little bit more. But it's important because we've been seeing a lot more discussion and relevance of hip hop. Recently, hip hop was named the number one genre of music, uh, surpassing mm-hmm. rock. Uh, so it's important just globally that we're beginning to have a much more cultural influence. We see the release of albums like Jay-Z's 444, right, which is kind of grown up hip hop, um, talking about things like financial literacy, uh, being a father, all these kind of things, which is more deeper than what we're kind of used to. Netflix is putting out a lot of great hip hop series, such as Roxanne, Roxanne, a story about Roxanne Shante, mm-hmm. who was like the first female battle rapper uh, who influenced people like Nas and Queensbridge, et cetera. They got a docuseries Rapture, uh, executive produced by Nas, in which they have a bunch of hip hop artists on there talking about their lives. But I watched one episode dealing with T.I. and talking about how he got into being, you know, more of a social activist and socially conscious. Um, And so there's a lot on it. And then also with the David uh, Letterman series, right? My next guest, Mm -hmm. he just recently had Jay-Z on, uh, which I watched too, which was a really good interview and getting some good insights into his mind and how things operate. So we see that just popular wise, popular culture wise, hip hop is taking on a a big role uh, as far as influencing what we see and what we do in the media. Mm -hmm. I I agree. I saw parts of that interview and the only thing I could I well, one of the things I got from that is blue runs that house, you know, <laughs> yeah, when he bow said down it. to blue. So, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I thought it was cute. He's shown himself to be like a awesome dad and just a loving dad. And I just I appreciate seeing that side of him because I, I've i seen people in the media, sometimes the right wing media, try to portray, portray him in certain ways. And I just think it's so awesome that he's showing, you know, the husband side, the, you know, husband who made a mistake side, but also mm-hmm. like this loving father who wants to be there and do right by his kids. Yeah. So I thought it was an awesome interview. And I've just appreciate the evolution of Jay-Z over the years from big pimping to, you know, Big daddy. <laughs> daddy <laughs> didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so it's good. And we're going to have a good conversation about this. So we hopefully you all tune in and enjoy it. Um, you know, I know people have been on Instagram and Twitter have been talking about, you know, with Drake's new single, Nice for What? And of course, Cardi B's new album that everybody's saying they're having already. They're getting their summer hashtags lined up. <laughs> so I'll be looking out for those. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Mark Anthony Neal, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal has uh, really, really been doing this for years, has a few mm-hmm. books out on this. And it's not just something he takes lightly. This is his research. This is his work. This is what he spends his life doing. Um, so he's very... He's a legend. He's, he's a, a legend. legend. Yeah, he's big. He's yeah. a big guy, big time. Um, and so we just appreciate him taking out the time to drop some knowledge. And, you know, showing that... We, and then part of doing this kind of interview is to show you all that, you know, when it comes to things like academia and research, it's, it's not all just boring stuff. You know, having more diversity in the field, people can study things that actually matter to us, like hip hop, mm-hmm. and write books about it and have conversations about it. A little known fact of what you hear in the interview is that uh, Rhapsody um, was a student of his at Duke, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that in the interview too. So, you know, it, it's we see the connections drawn there and we see how, you know, you can do a lot of things with academia, not just the traditional boring stuff that people may think we do. Um, so hopefully you all enjoy and we'll catch you after the interview. Today, 
we're interviewing Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, a professor of Black popular culture in the Department of African and African American Studies at Duke University. The focus of our conversation is Black masculinity, its relation to hip hop and popular culture. Specifically, we discuss how Black male identity is constructed in media and how the cultural script imposed on Black men are used to justify violence against Black male bodies. Additionally, we discuss the representation of Blackness on TV and the relationship between Black popular culture and social change. Today, we welcome Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. Welcome to the BHD podcast, Professor Neal. We typically begin interviews by asking our guests to tell us a little bit more about themselves. So what do you currently do and what inspired your particular interests? Okay, Um, I'm currently professor of African and African-American studies and professor of English at Duke University, uh, where I'm also the chair of the Department of African and African-American studies. Um, I've been at Duke now for 14 years uh, I spent a year at the University of Texas at Austin before then, and I spent six years um, at the State University of New York at Albany, uh, where I was also a professor of Africana Studies and a professor of English. Um, so I, I've been doing this roughly for about 20-something years. Um, my interest or my, my research area really is black popular culture and black popular music um, with some attention to gender and sexuality within that context class. Um, I'm also a scholar of uh, black intellectual history, um, particularly the realm of of public intellectuals over the last 20, 25 years. Um, And this is really stuff that I've been carrying with me all my life. Um, My interest in music comes directly um, from my relationship with my father and him exposing me to various forms of black music when I was a kid. And I just happened to be pursuing my dissertation in American studies at the University of Buffalo at a time where I had a certain kind of freedom uh, to read about and write about Black popular music, which became my first book, What the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Black Public Culture, uh, which was published by Routledge in 1999. So I guess Black popular music can consist of a lot of things, but I guess for the premise of this discussion, we can keep it on hip hop. So just to start off with a general question, what is your take on the general state of hip hop today and its cultural influences? Well, there are ways in which I I would suggest that hip hop um, is as vibrant as it ever was now uh, and and with some caveats. Um, Most of when we typically talk about hip hop, um, we typically talk about commercial hip hop and what we hear on the radio and what we might hear on streaming services. And, And generally speaking, that makes up a small percentage of the totality of hip hop that's being produced. When we think about hip hop in a more global realm, um, in terms of where it's being produced around the globe, its functions around the globe, and, and even its functions here in the United States away from the mainstream, um, what you see is a, is a vibrant, exciting um, subculture um, that has existed here in the United States for about 50 years. Any favorite artists, past or present? Well, you know, I got a couple of biases. I'm a, I'm a kid that was born and raised in the Bronx. Okay. Um, so I have a Northeast bias. Uh, I will always tell you that the best hip hop that was made was made in the East Coast between 1988 and 1996. Uh, And I pretty much won't waver on that. Um, But I'm also someone who uh, is raising two daughters, one 15 and one 19, and I'm living in the South. Um, So at least with the 15 year old, I spend a lot of time listening to Uzi Vert and Yachty and, 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 and all those, you know, folks. Um, But when it comes down to the artists that I kind of go back to time and time again, um, I don't think any is as gifted as Rakim. Um, He's always going to be the top of the pecking order for me. Um, And and Jay falls in there for me. But I'm also a big fan of of Ice Cube uh, in terms of artists who have had a certain kind of sustainability about their career. And thinking about the music that you gravitate toward versus the music that kids these days tend to like, what would you say are some of the major differences between current hip hop trends and those that were popular in the 80s and 90s? At least when I came up, um, there was much more of a focus on um, lyrical dexterity um, in terms of content, what people were saying, um, the kind of words they used, the kind of language they used, the kind of themes that they talked about. Um, in contemporary hip hop, at least is some of the stuff that's in the mainstream. Um, there's not as much attentiveness to that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't being ideas being conveyed 
even in the context of that. I, I think you have a younger generation of artists who simply have much more access to better technology in order to record music. Um, they have the ability to record with each other in ways that artists were forced to really record with folks who were in this specific locale. Um, now, because of digital technology, it's fairly easy to do collaborative efforts without physically having to be in the same space anymore. And and they're also functioning in a moment where the music is legitimately worldwide. Um, you know, when Big Daddy Kane and, and Rakim are having their battles over who's the best in 88, 89, it's really a small audience that's paying attention to that. There isn't a global audience yet for hip hop. So hip hop changes now and is different now in that regard in terms of its reach, in terms of technology, um, the fact that there is a supporting technology in terms of, of social media, where there's also much much more attentiveness to how guys are looking and women are looking in hip hop and what they're doing because of Instagram and other things is just fundamentally different than it was 30 years ago. Yeah. Going along those lines of performing your book, looking for Leroy centers around the discussion of legible identities and illegible identities. So can you tell us what that means for our listeners, just to give us a better idea of the concepts in your book? Yeah. You know, the premise of looking for Leroy is that, you know, there are ways in which if we see, uh, black males um, in certain ways, we, we know how to read them. So if we see a black man with a basketball, for instance, um, that's not an image that forces us to process much, right? Because that's an image we see all the time, right? Arguably the most well-known black man in the world, with the exception of Barack Obama, is a black man with a basketball in terms of LeBron James, or if we go back 20 years ago in terms of, of Michael Jordan. But if we were to see that same black man with a violin, that would give us reason to pause. Um, and we literally would erect a series of questions to try to explain this image that we're seeing because it's not an image that we normally see. So I was making the argument in the context of the book that we have these kind of iconic black men. And in the context of the book, they're Jay-Z, they're Luther Vandross, um, they're R. Kelly, um, the actor Avery Brooks, um, and um, you know Edith Elder and his role of Stringer Bell in The Wire, that these were all men who troubled and complicated our sense of what legibility was as it related to African-American men. So with that being said, we know that kind of what you already alluded to with the presence of technology and social media, many artists are more visible, which I think has helped enhance their persona and their visibility. Hip hop, and I just saw this recently, the number one genre surpassing rock music not too long ago. So the performance of these identities being legible and illegible. And I think that probably in the 90s, it seemed to be one dominant arc in terms of legible identities, probably in the form of hyper masculinity. And now currently we see people, like you said, Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Yachty, Young Thug. So what is your take on the differences between legible and illegible identities from the 90s artists and many of the artists we see emerging today? Well, we clearly have much more of an access to the backstory of contemporary artists in ways that we didn't have for previous generations of artists, whether or not we're talking about hip hop or not. Um, I think we see a generation of, of young people in general, and it's just reflected in hip hop in this way, um, that have a much more malleable version or idea of what gender and what identity is. So they're much more willing to take risk. Again, when you think about the cover to... Um, to young thugs, Jeffrey. And, and he's looking like literally he just, you know, walked off the stage and had just formed revelations, you know, with Alvin Ailey. Um, it is a striking image because it's an image that we're not used to seeing within the context of hip hop. Um, but again, these are younger folks who are thinking about gender very differently in their everyday lives and thus are much more comfortable pushing against the boundaries of what is presumed to be normative gender performances, um, you know, in the context of their art. You know, keep in mind, this is a moment in which the culture is for the first time in, in talking, I'm not talking specifically hip hop, but more broadly, American culture is more uh, is more attentive to issues of, for instance, transgender in ways that it was virtually invisible in the culture, you know, even 10 years ago. So in the context of young folks who are growing up with with peers who are transgendered male or transgendered female, um, in the context of folks thinking about, uh, you know, gender and sexuality in wide open spaces, it would be natural that we would start to see that reflected in the performances of masculinity in the context of hip hop. 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know your work focuses on masculinity, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on whether and how the concept of legible and illegible identities might apply to women or femininity in hip hop and entertainment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> it, it is not um, the work that I necessarily do, um, though. I love reading the work of anybody from Brittany Cooper to Treva Lindsay to a range of other uh, of my colleagues who are doing really great work in terms of the popular realms of, of black femininity. You know, I'll take it for a moment in the context of hip hop. I mean, the early presence of, of hip hop, the early presence of women in hip hop, you know, which goes back to the earliest days. <laughs> very often we think about the women in hip hop as being kind of a. Uh, uh, accoutrements, if you will, to the culture, um, though of obviously they're participating in very real and important ways. When you think about the career arc of someone like MC Light, um, who became popular in part because she rhymed like a guy. You know, she sounded with a deeper, huskier voice. Her femininity was kind of downplayed in the context of her music. And you go forward and think about, you know, that moment where we have Foxy Brown and, and we have Lil' Kim and, and folks like, um, uh, you know, trying to jog my memory, like Yo-Yo, um, who are much more attuned to presenting some aspect of their femininity and their sexuality in the context of hip hop, you know, to a moment now where we can look at the Cardi B's um, in this particular moment in her own relationship to things like Instagram and social media, I think what we have seen is something that is often fluid. I think we've paid way too much more attention in terms of women in hip hop to how they look and how they fit into hip hop as to having very real conversations about the lyrical content and some of the, the skill sets of women within hip hop. Um, if we talked about skill sets, then we wouldn't really have a problem trying to include MC Light in the conversation because her skill set suggests that she's someone who has had a remarkable career and should be considered, for instance, within anybody's top 20. When we consider Lauren Hill, not the Lauren Hill that we get in the miseducation, but the Lauren Hill who is really straight a rapper still in the context of the Fugees, you know, then we're talking about an artist who's someone who we would consider in, in most cases within the top 10. And again, if you look at someone like Rhapsody now, you know, coming out of Snow Hill, North Carolina, you know, and I'm biased, right? You know, before, you know, Rhapsody blew up, um, you know, in the Grammy Award nominations and the work with Kendrick and obviously signing, you know, with uh, with Jay-Z's label um, and the joint venture with with Jamla, you know, this is someone who sat in my classes for the last six or seven years while Ninth Wonder and I were, were co-teaching our class on the history of hip hop. So I am a little biased. But again, when you listen to Layla's wisdom, you know, what you hear is a, a hip hop artist who is functioning at the highest levels of her craft. And there's no need to add in front of her name that this is Rhapsody, a female rapper. Right. She's just straight up representing the best of what's happening in hip hop these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can definitely agree with that. And I do feel like Rhapsody, just creatively and musically, is definitely one of the top artists doing it right now, period, male or female. And although she did, and I've known about her for a little while as well, although she did get the Grammy nods, I still uh, think her buzz isn't as big as the buzz of, say, a Nicki Minaj or Cardi B with regards to, you know, popularity. So do you think just the expected performance of femininity from legible and illegible perspective, does that play a role in the differences as why someone like a Rhapsody is not as popular as a Nicki Minaj and Cardi B? I, I think we just have to be honest about, you know, and we could be talking about rap, we could be talking about other genres of entertainment. You know, when when you live in, in a hyper-masculine patriarchy, um, women function in certain kinds of ways within the culture. And we tend to pay much more attention to what women look like and their hair and their clothing and their fashion and their style than to actually deal with the actual crux of what their skill sets are. So whether that we're talking about Hollywood, I mean, it's not surprising that very often the most successful Hollywood actresses are women who typically are appealing to us in terms of what they look like. Um, the same thing goes in terms of the music industry. And, you know, to Rhapsody's credit, um, because there's a little sidebar here, you know, I think Rhapsody is cute as hell. But on that side tip, you know, she hasn't played to the desire of the culture to want to see her in a certain kind of way. She just has remained Rhapsody. And I think, you know, you're, there's always going to be a price that's paid for not willing to play the game the way that the game wants to be played. You know, this is a price that Missy Elliott has paid over the 
last 20 years for not willing to play the game the way the game wants to be played. You can make that same claim about Queen Latifah over the last 25 years of not playing the game the way folks want the game to be played. I think the jury's still out on folks like Nicki Minaj. I think the jury's still out on people like Cardi B, particularly Cardi B, because this is at the beginning of a career. We're not going to know what this is going to look like, um, you know, 10 years down the road. Again, when you think about someone like Beyonce and what we thought of Beyonce, say, in 1999 versus how we think about Beyonce in 2018, this is someone who got into the game playing the game a certain kind of way, but has now been able to dictate how she's going to do her work, how she's going to do it and what kind of story she's going to tell. So that in many ways, the idea of Beyonce being beautiful, for instance, or someone who's attractive is really a second thought, you know, in light of the kind of work that she's produced, particularly visually over the last five or six years. I definitely agree with that. Going back to the discussion of legible versus illegible identities, I was wondering if you could tell us more about what it means overall and why it's important, especially in relation to the danger that black bodies often face within the U.S. You know, one of the reasons why, you know, I I was drawn to this kind of narrative um, you know, some of this is coming, you know, in the aftermath of, of Trayvon Martin's um, killing, you know, though it's a book that I have been working on much longer before that period of time. But there are ways in which, you know, we read bodies, we read culture, we read style. And black men have typically been read um, in the context of being something to be afraid of, something that was dangerous. And very often, you know, black men just to be able to survive have had to kind of play to the cues of the culture in order to go to the culture in certain kinds of ways. And I think we're just at a moment now, and part of this is Barack Obama's presidency. You know, part of it is just a kind of shifting in terms of technology and our ability to be able to do a better job of documenting who we are as black people that you just see now a, a generation of folks who are kind of pushing back against the way we've been constrained. You know, someone like Jay-Z has been fascinating to me because, you know, even as we think about Jay-Z hip hop mogul and whatever that represents, you know, the images that we see of Jay-Z with Blue Ivy um, are fairly remarkable in the cult in a culture in which we don't normally think that black men actually have relationships with their children. We don't think black men are present in the lives of their children. So to have someone as visible as Jay-Z really publicly, you know, perform this idea that he's a father and not just a father in the sense that in name only, but this is someone who's engaged with the life of his daughter and now his uh, his daughter and his second daughter and his son. I think these are important images for us to be able to see in the culture that challenges these ongoing perceptions that have demonized black men historically. Yeah. Talking about Jay-Z, of course, your book was published way before his most recent album, 444, came out. But you do spend a chapter talking about the progression of Jay-Z and his identity and how he navigates the terrain of being a hip hop artist, but also being a popular mogul and things like business and popular culture. So with the hype around 444, And I'm also noticing the work he's doing outside of music, such as executive producing the series on Khalif Browder. And I think now he's also producing another series on Trayvon Martin and really even just the content of 444, where he's addressing financial literacy and the giving advice to the black community and his listeners and his fans on how we can move forward as a community. So how do you explain the transformation of Jay-Z up until this point we see today? I, I'm one of these folks, that, you know, and I've been telling folks this for a while. I'd like to say that I anticipated 444, you know, and all the stuff that I wrote in the chapter on Jay-Z and looking for Leroy, because some of the stuff that we see him talk about in 444, I mean, you can actually hear resonances of that in his work as early as the blueprint, you know, going back 17 years earlier. The fact that we were as a culture unwilling to hear him work through and grapple through those issues, I think is important. The the fact of the matter is we have historically infantilized hip hop and its audience. We typically talk about hip hop as being a culture that's specifically youth culture, that is specifically targeted to 14 and 18 year olds. And, and while there is a stream of hip hop that's incredibly popular that, for instance, speaks to my 15 year old daughter, the fact of the matter is, is that you have folks who are working within hip hop, both as artists in other realms, 
that are in their early 60s at this point in time. Um, what would hip hop, and this is a question that I asked in the context of the book, you know, what does hip hop look like if hip hop was 40 years old and had to pay a mortgage and had two car notes and was paying for public, for private school for its kids? And if hip hop had an IRA, you know, what happens when hip hop grows up? And one of the things that Jay Z's 444 proved is that, in fact, there is an audience for hip hop that has grown just as there's a different and separate sometimes audience for hip hop for teenagers and that hip hop can sustain that much the same way country music has sustained that um, jazz music has sustained it. Any genre of music has been able to sustain a multi-generational interest, but because we've often infantilized hip hop, we didn't think hip hop can do that. 444 was the thing that suggested that it could. And we, again, we can see elements of Jay-Z moving in that direction, you know, going back to kingdom come, um, right when he's beginning to talk about some of these more interior these interior issues, you know his music being more drawn to his own interiority. When you look at Jay Z and and I I look at projects like someone like Merce, um, a, a rapper out of L.A. who's been dealing with depression and and, and his new album Three Sixteen, which comes out shortly, he actually talks about dealing with crib death for one of his children, the difficulties of adoption. These are the kind of themes that we've been willing to hear everybody else talk about, but didn't think that black men were capable. Of. When you think about Farrell Monch and his album uh, Post Traumatic Syndrome, which came out two years ago, and he's talking about his own struggles with depression. When you listen to Fonte Coleman's new album, and he's talking about everything from having to wear a CPAP machine to go to sleep to deal with slat sleep apnea to dealing with high blood pressure, the death of a grandfather and a father. These are all issues that black men have always thought about, now we have a context in which these hip-hop artists can talk about it and put it in their music. I think in this regard, 444 is just the beginning of the cutting edge of this particular moment of of older Black men being able to explore certain aspects of interiority in their music. As you mentioned, um, there have always been different subcultures within a hip-hop genre. Some receive more attention than others. In regard to hip-hop, that speaks to the heart of what individuals are facing and or that addresses more serious issues. What do you think are some of the barriers to pushing these alternative forms of hip-hop to the forefront? Um, what does it take to make those subgenres uh, more mainstream? Uh, uh, you know, I think if you you ask most of the artists why they record this. Well, I won't say why they record the stuff they record. Why the stuff that gets released gets released. Um, I think very often they will tell you that it's some combination of the record companies and their own understanding of what drives their audience and what their audience is, is interested in listening to. And if we're going to think about specifically hip hop as a youth based culture, you know, most 17 year olds aren't thinking about, you know, what healthcare is in terms of their lives, right, at, at that particular point in time. So it's about trying to find a balance. I always use the example of Lil Wayne as an artist that we take for granted that he's not concerned with these kinds of issues. So that when you listen to the Carter Two, and particularly when you listen to the last track, you know, um, Misunderstanding, um, and he goes on a, what is it, a brilliant screed about the prison industrial complex, and he's very critical of black leadership that speaks for black people but don't actually have a relationship for black people. And again, this is not the track that's going to be released. This is not the track that's, you know, going to have a music video. This is a track that you literally have to go to the last track on the album, right, and try to figure out, you know, what it is. So there are always been elements of that stuff in the work for all of these artists, but in terms of how prominent it can be, had a lot to do with what the marketplace was willing to sustain. You know, when I listened to 50 Cent offer his critique, for instance, of 444, and he goes, well, you know, it, it wasn't banging in the clubs with the 17-year-olds. Well, that wasn't the point. This is an album that still managed to go platinum that was largely supported and sustained by people over the age of 35 because now there's an audience for it. I think when it shows that we have an audience that wants to support certain kind of product and whether or not we're talking about hip hop or whether or not we're talking about film. Right. You know, Tyler Perry movies get made over and over again because there's an audience that supports it. We haven't yet to show that there's an audience, for instance, that will be able to sustain movies like Moonlight uh, over a period of time. You know, it's one thing to support Black Panther and the Marvel brand, that's easy to support, right? But when you start talking about little complex black films that deal with our interiorities, that becomes a much more difficult conversation. So obviously more folks have seen Black Panther than ever saw Mudbound, 
as an example, right? And that has to do with the, the nature of the film. It's historical nature. It's not a happy film. It also has to do with the fact that the filmmaker is a black queer woman, right? And if you have a community that's still ambivalent about some of those kinds of issues, they're not necessarily going to support the art that they create. So it often comes down to what kind of audience there is. And if you're a young artist, of course, you need that audience to be able to sustain yourself. Um, there are artists who don't need that audience, right? So when you look at someone like Michelle and Diego Cello, who is not needed, I kind of pop audience, you know, for 20 years, she can continue to do the kind of groundbreaking work that she can because she doesn't need that support. I don't think we've yet found a sustainable model within hip hop that allows for those kinds of outliers within the context of hip hop. So my last couple of questions, especially because we're already moving in that direction, has to do with black media, movies, shows, et cetera. And you spend time in your book talking about shows, too, like The Wire and others. So what is your take on the current black representation in media, such as movies like Black Panther, which is breaking a bunch of records and bringing in over a billion dollars, but also TV shows like Blackish, Atlanta, Insecure, Queen Sugar, The Shy, that are also popular and great shows that have been emerging over these past couple of years. So just overall, what are your thoughts on this current state of black representation in media and television, et cetera? You know, from the outside as a consumer, um, the fact that I can watch This Is Us and I can watch The Quad, um, the fact that I can watch any number of these Tyler Perry bad television shows and and derive some joy out of watching bad television. um, And at the same time, on the same channel, right, in terms of own, can watch um, Ava DuVernay's Queen Sugar. From my standpoint as an outsider to Hollywood and as a consumer, it seems as though we're actually having a renaissance moment in terms of the production of black visuals, in terms of television, in terms of film, in terms of what we see in terms of the Broadway stage and off Broadway stage. Um, this is a moment that seems um, unprecedented. Um, but when you talk to folks in the industry, um, they will tell you about the hundreds of other projects that haven't gotten green lit. The fact that there aren't enough people within the industry in a position to be able to green light projects. Um, you know, in part, Black Panther gets done because one of the Marvel producers is an African-American man. Um, this is something that's a new phenomenon that might not have existed 15 years ago, right? So Black Panther doesn't get green lit without the presence of someone like that in the industry. Um, when we hear the stories recently about the challenges that Blackish has faced trying to tell a politically charged story and Kenya Burris, who created the show, and ABC deciding that they were going to squash an episode because they didn't want to have to deal with the tensions around it, um, speaks to the fact that even in this moment where there's so much stuff out there, it's still being policed in certain kinds of ways. So it's a great time to be excited, but not to be too overly excited. Many people and historians have actually suggested that art is often at the forefront of social change, or it is a catalyst for social change movements. Movements. So in thinking about our current moment in regard to the diversity that we see on TV and, you know, our political environment, where do you think art fits into the moment, into this moment? What are some of the strengths uh, and limitations of art as a form of resistance and social change? I think you can never look to the mainstream for that kind of work. And in many ways, when we talk about political impulses in the art, the mainstream catches up to it later, right? Do you think about the success of someone like Marvin Gaye in his album, What's Going On, you know, which when all is said and done remains one of the most politically sophisticated soul recordings, R&B recordings ever done. But he does his recording eight years after the March on Washington, right? He does his recording three years after Martin Luther King's murder. You know, in the mainstream of popular culture, it also often takes a while for it to be able to catch up. I think if we want to see where the real tensions are going, it's on parts of, of African-American popular culture, black popular culture. That's a little bit more on, on, a, on, on the underground. That's a little bit less finished and, and less polished. Um, so that when we think about, you know, what we used to think about as underground hip hop in the 1990s, the role that that played in the generation, a uh, generation of folks who get, begin to get politicized, you know, Talib Kweli and most deaf were not mainstream artists in that regard. 
But when we talk about conscious rap in the 1990s, those are the folks that we go to, even though they were existing on the underground. I think for this moment now, we need to look at where the independent black filmmakers and what kind of film are they making. I think D. Reeves is part of that kind of generation of folks. Uh, where's the music that's kind of functioning more on the underground that's a little bit more politically charged? I think that's even with her relationship with with uh, uh, with uh, Jay Z's uh, label, Rock Nation. Rhapsody is someone who's actually doing very interesting political work that's a little bit below the mainstream. Um, and so I think when we think about streaming television services, the kind of work that was being done um, by so many of these great filmmakers now and television folks that's not really meeting, reaching, reaching the mainstream, but actually reaching a kind of smaller subset of folks. I think that's where we see the real political, politically charged popular art. Mm, wow. OK, OK. Well, we would just like to thank you so much, Dr. Neil, for taking the time to come speak with us today about your work and having this conversation. Is there anything you would like to say in closing or anything that you would like to shout out as far as where people can meet you or find you on social media or anything? You can follow me on Twitter at New Black Man. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Booker BB Brown. Um, and I just want to give the two of you all a shout out. It's so important to have young thinkers and scholars out there creating new content um, that folks can be able to gravitate to and get some great information. So, you know, uh, props to the both of you for the work that you're doing. Okay, thank you so much. All right. So, Daph, what you think? You know, I thought, well, I'll first say, I thought it was so cool to talk to a professor who knows so much about, like, hip-hop and hip-hop, to know that that can be a career, to study Black culture, you know, Black hip-hop and be in the know. Like, it, first of all, it just seems enjoyable. Um, Mm -hmm. But second, it was just an enjoyable conversation. I I like some of the things that, uh, you know, he had to say. I like the concept of, like, the legible versus illegible Black identity. I'm, I'm very much interested in like checking out some of the scholars he mentioned, like Britton Cooper, and trying to wrestle with what that looks like for Black women. Um, what are the different legible identities and, and what happens when, you know, uh, actually, you know what, thinking about that, I think Shuri, you know, she's a new Black identity, Black female identity uh, from Black Panther, for those of you who have not watched. And if you have not watched, mm, Shame on you. Shame on you. Um, but just thinking about, yeah, those black women or feminine identities and legible and illegible and, you know, what that looks like. So I kind of want to explore that a little bit more. Yeah, that that was a really good part of the conversation, although most of his work focuses on masculinity mm-hmm. and legible and illegible. Um, I think we are seeing this approach and it can be easily discussed when it comes to women. Um, within hip hop or within the various other performances of black popular culture, such as the shy, you know, the writer of the shy, she is a, a lesbian woman, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the show is awesome. Um, and, you know, having the space for somebody who fits into that particular category wasn't always probably the case. And now it's being more accepted. And, um, and she was, she started on, I forgot her name. What's her name? Um, Lena, Leah. I can't remember her name. I know she was also a writer or, or co-wrote the episode on with Aziz Ansari show on Netflix. Mm-hmm. It's giving an episode, which was really like one of the best episodes on that show. And I was, I was like, oh, okay, I felt good when I heard that she uh, wrote that episode because I actually won an award in Emmy or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, those conversations are really good to be had. And especially to me from his book, right? A lot of it was talking about artists like Jay-Z and people, artists in the nineties, especially he mentioned like Ice Cube, et cetera. And they are, you know, really perform masculinity in this, you know, the dominant way of the time. And as time has progressed, we see with these new artists that they are performing masculinity in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because on one end, we hear that the the older artists, you know, sometimes talking smack about them and saying, ah, you know, they're not real artists or they're not, you know, real, real rappers, you know, because of the way they dress and the way they look. Uh, But I think, you know. A part of that is because they don't fit into that kind of traditional sense of how you're supposed to display masculinity. And I think, I truly think that, you know, on one end, hmm, I had some my reservations about, not really about their looks, but about their content, right? Their creativity more than their performances. But I think it does serve a, some value to have this variation 
of black masculinity, because I think when we talk about things like the danger of black bodies, it's what how we've always been traditionally viewed and perceived and danger, right, as dangerous. And so having this variation will, I think, call, like you said, the the thing about being illegible is that causes people to pause for a moment. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, you know, this is this is different, right? Basketball, we're used to. Violin, we're not, right? So rappers, we're used to you looking one way, wearing the gold chains, but you got, you know, pink hair and, you know, wear these tight jeans. What is this about, right? So you can perform this way and still be accepted or be looked at differently. So I think that pause can actually save lives to an extent, you know, uh, because now people won't be able to quickly just typecast a black person without with that traditional viewpoint of, of the dominant narrative that was probably more present in the 90s with the Tupacs and the Biggies and, and everyone else and the Jay-Zs and, and such. So I think there's some value to that. I I think so as well. And it's just, I'm thinking about that conversation and how like, I, I really hope that you and I can have a conversation just about like gender, like in the black community and gender, um, I say in gender in general, um, because mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that this interview made me think of, like challenging traditional gender stereotypes uh, and, and, and gender norms um, and the pushback that does or does not receive in the community and like the different forms it is, is and is not received. I feel like that's a conversation um, that we have to have. And, you know, Professor Neil also mentioned, you know, kind of who's at the, the forefront of like, you know, social change, like with, within art movements and how you have to look at the underground, uh, like underground, um, and subcultures, uh, to like see where we're going and how like some of those, some of the people who are at the forefront, who are, you know, you know, producing um, films and music that's, that's pushing the, you know, pushing boundaries, you know, they have different identities. They might have queer identities or, you know, they, you know, just may have identities that aren't necessarily accepted and or receives pushback in like traditional or mainstream black culture. And I feel like that's a conversation that we also need to have. It's not a conversation that we necessarily have. I think it came up, but I think it speaks to um, the need for us to kind of like poke at that conversation a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, the, um, the question, you know, you, you asked about women in hip hop and now that I'm kind of thinking about it, I get, you know, the Nicki Minaj, the Cardi B, the Young M.A., the Rhapsody, they're all very different. As far as just being a true artist who is like really a good rapper, of course, Rhapsody is top of the line there, you know. Um, and I think even when it comes to somebody like a Nicki Minaj and a Cardi B, who are somewhat similar, their approaches are also very different because as far as how they present themselves, right? I mean, we all know that Nicki Minaj has some kind of surgery, right, on her body when it comes to either her, her butt, breasts, whatever, right? Cardi B has also had this, but she's been very open mm-hmm. about it, right? Uh, because she doesn't want young girls to, you know, she's like, yo, this is fake. You know, don't do it. She said that she's regretted it, right? That getting the butt, getting the, the breast implants, et cetera. While Nicki Minaj is usually very quiet about it. She doesn't speak, but she still is being a role model to a lot of these young black girls, right? And they may be trying to get what she has, uh, but is it all that necessary, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So I think even just the approaches of like the different narratives from both of them are important too. Um, And even though people try to continuously try to pit them against each other, uh, which can be another discussion, but I think what's more important is how they are navigating the way they are portraying, portraying or their performance of it, right? So, you know, Cardi B is always, I think that's one of the reasons Cardi B has gotten popular because she was just always just very honest, right? About what she liked, about what she didn't like. She would feel when people talked about her teeth and at first she wasn't trying to get her teeth fixed and she got a bag and fixed the teeth. (laughs) (laughs) But she's she's always been just open about it, right? And um, I think that there's an extreme value to that um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I Uh, agree as, as well. I, I mean, like you said, this is a really different conversation, but I would, I would also like to have another conversation about how I think at least within hip hop, um, black men, like there can be like different representations of legible identities. And although, you know, there are differences between like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, like there in, in terms of like, 
how they sell that image, I think is a little bit different, but like the image is, is kind of similar in terms of what is elevated in terms of like who can be at the top. And I think when it comes to uh, women in hip hop, there's this idea that there can only be one. And the ones that are, that typically are like elevated into like, you know, the number one spot on like the top, you know, female hip hop person at the time, I think it um, is generally that sexualized uh, image. Um, Some might, say over sexualized or hypersexualized image um of like the black woman versus like I feel like one person that's trying to or trying to change that because I know I recently heard like something her rap like oh you used to talk about me say I look like a boy Janelle Monet. Yeah and how like mm-hmm. you know she's pushing the boundaries of like feminine and I, I really love her and she's also seems like she's trying to rap a little bit. So um yeah. Yeah, she's trying to throw her hat in the pool. I think, um, you know, I just saw that article as well when he talked about Blackish in that episode they pulled. Um, he didn't talk about what it was, but what it was is that they were doing an episode on mm-hmm. healing, like the Kaepernick situation. And, uh, both, yeah, the, the creator of the show and ABC decided to pull it. Uh, they said for creative differences, which was kind of disappointing in a way, because I feel like Blackish has really been doing a good job at addressing these issues. And I feel like a lot of these issues, you know, were not are not easy to talk about. So I'm very curious to see why they would run away from that particular episode. Of course, from the basic premise of the episode, I just know that that Dre and his son Jr. Were, just had two different perspectives on on the kneeling, right? Or, you know, generational differences, what have you. And they were going to play off of those differences. Um, I feel like it's a good conversation to be had because it's real in a lot of ways, but I'm curious to know, like, and to me, it's not even that bad or, hot, you know, controversial thing to talk about. Um, it's a show they've been doing addressing this kind of stuff. So I don't know why they decided not to show us. I'm kind of disappointed in that. I think... I don't know. The nailing thing has been like such an emotionally charged issue. You know, they're not trying to get that NFL ratings uh, decline. <laughs> I think that's, you know, essentially what it's about. The network, like, hell no. So, mm. yeah. Then it's like, who's, who are your loyalties towards then, right? When, you know, because if it's for, you know, the black folk, we're going to keep watching, you know, but yeah. you're on that major network, so you have to consider. The viewership of the non people of color, white yeah. folks and the like. Um, so yeah, so it's a lot. It's a lot to unpack there, and then you know, definitely his conversations about current representation and movies and shows. I do love Queen Sugar by Avery DuVernay, one of my favorite shows. You watch that show? Yeah, I watch it. So I will say my my TV watching habits is like I binge watch everything. Like I don't I don't watch anything on a regular basis. It's just kind of like when I'm ready to procrastinate, I'm like, hmm, I haven't watched Queen Sugar in a long time. And so, yeah, but I do like Queen Sugar. I do like it. Yeah, Queen Sugar is such a a really good show. Just like well read Um, and the nuances involved. It's a really good show. I enjoy it. But yeah, all the other shows, too. You know, I watch all of them. I should. You watch I, Tyler Perry too. I, no, I don't watch Tyler Perry. <laughs> no, that was funny. <laughs> that was hilarious. But you know what? It's, there's an audience for that show. Tyler Perry actually has a new movie coming out. I actually yeah, I might go saw. see it. I mean, I feel like, like it's Tar- the same it's movie. Mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. it's the same movie I've seen over and over again. It is. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, uh, I think I'm going to see it. I think I'll buy one of those 90, those um, $90 movie passes where you can see a, a movie every day. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm going to just do that. And then I was like, hmm, I'll go see it. You know, because Tyler Perry, he has, I will say, he gets a lot of flack. But, you know, he he has done it for the culture, you know, in a lot of ways and like, you know, got some big budget. And I, I actually heard that, like, he allows, I don't know, I want to say Black Panther, but I could be wrong. But he has recently, like, you know, allow like other black films to like use his studios and stuff like that. So, yeah, yes. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know if it's Black Panther, but definitely I, I've heard of that recently. Yeah. He was doing that. I mean, he like. Tyler Perry is Tyler Perry, you know, it's his movies, you know, when it first was coming out, I was like, okay, you know, Medea, everything was funny. I enjoyed it. 
Uh, and then, you know, then I'm like, okay, you know, can we get something else? But I feel like the plots, on, the plots, um, plots, the plots are pretty repetitive. Yeah. Um, the storylines, you know, it's fine, but he does have an audience, a fan base that really enjoys it. So I can't, can't hate on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I generally don't like watching movies when I already know the, you know, what's going to happen, beginning, middle of, or an end, but I do like to ride fans. And, and so I'm, I'm pro- I probably will check that out, but I, yeah, I don't watch yeah, them. I mean, do you, did you see that her last movie? <laughs> Oh, Proud Mary? Yes. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't see it. But I was just like, this movie is just, it's just, it, I didn't feel it. You know, I'm like, Taraji, I don't know, this is kind of movie for you. I just couldn't believe it, you know? Her out there yeah, being when I uh, the uh, assassin, wielding guns, trying to run. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is your role, Taraji. <laughs> Yeah, so it was. It's one of those things. Like I, when I see previews, I am drawn to some things and just not drawn to other things. I just wasn't drawn to that. So, you know, yeah, it didn't do well yeah, either. I so. But yeah, I also heard like you know, I I support black film. I support mm-hmm. black movies and stuff like that. You know, but it doesn't mean you're gonna like everything. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious to see when she's going to hang up Empire. She already said that she ain't trying to do that forever. Oh, yeah. I stopped watching Empire a long time ago. I did watch it the first season, though. Yeah, I watch it. It's like a show that I record and I watch it when I get to it. But it's not like I'm not like running to see it anymore. Like, oh, man, got to see what happened. I'm like, okay, I watch some other shows. Now I'll see what happened on Empire. Yeah. Yeah. so many shows but yeah yeah. it just kind of speaks to what you know professor uh, neil said about like just the current representation of blackness on tv like i need to start watching atlanta like it's just a lot of things that i plan to watch that i just haven't gotten to but the fact Mm -hmm. that i can have insecure you know i can have queen sugar i can have um how to get away with murder although that you know that's a diverse cast but it has a a black leading um leading lady it's just kind of like i love our current moment and I I hope it's not like one of those things kind of like that happened in the 90s when we had like living single and we had that uh cop show with uh Malik Yoba you know what I'm talking about Mm -hmm. like we had all of the oh we had Martin we had all of these black shows it was like a black renaissance and then it just went away forever so I hope that this moment is here to stay and it's not just a tease and then everything gets canceled and it takes another 20 years to you know, come up with all this great content. Yeah, they're trying to bring back Martin and everything now, which I'm skeptical about. I'm like, uh, talking about maybe Martin, talking about maybe Fresh Prince, um, something else too. They're talking about bringing back. So yeah, we'll see about that. But I think like what he said, the important aspect of it is not just being writers and directors, but getting, being producers and being able to ones to call mm-hmm. the shots, you know, of like, oh, we want this film. That's where we truly win. Then once we have those positions solidified, then we won't have to worry about us dying out because we, you know, once it's, that's the scary thing about it. Like right now it's hot. And I think even a lot of the white folk know it's hot. And so they're going to keep pushing out that content. But when they don't feel like doing it anymore, mm-hmm. then they can just be like, no, you know, cancel. No do this and so we do need to have be in those positions of power where we can be like no we're going to keep this on and we'll cancel we're going to cancel your (laughs) (laughs) well no because the fact that Shonda Rhimes is is thank God it's Thursday like and there are like two new Mm -hmm. shows coming out like a fire fire station one about like the fire station that's connected to Grey's Anatomy and like another law show that's like connected to Grey's in some way I'm like yeah and she's yes, going to Netflix, that. so that's going to be very yeah. interesting, you know, to see what she does. I'm sure it's going to be some great content. And the good thing about it is that we won't have to wait every week. <laughs> we definitely probably going to be binge watching her shows the way she yeah. set up her shows. Yeah. <laughs> but all right. Well, it was good. Good talking as usual. And thank Dr. Neil for taking the time and his very busy schedule to Converse with us about the state of hip hop culture, his scholarship. I think it was very informative. Hopefully all you, all our listeners learned something from that and, uh, can take away and just maybe have a little different perspective on and value some of the new personalities 
and identities we've been seeing in these streams, whether it's regard to hip hop or uh, just popular culture in general, I think there's a lot to take away from it. Let's not be so quick to shun our people away just because they don't fit into the traditional mode. We need this expansion of identity uh, overall. So that way we can uh, have more legible identities instead of this, you know, one or two ways we can be viewed. Because mm-hmm. I feel like most people don't fit into these three or four boxes that we've created anyway. So like, you know, accepting other people allows you to, you know, be who you are. And even, even with me personally growing up, right? Like, you know, 2000s, hip hop artists. I really wasn't like super into hip hop because a lot of the, the music did not didn't relate to my life, right? I mean, I was in school, I played mm-hmm. sports, I was good. I wasn't out there gang banging and selling drugs. Like a lot, I'm taking with the people like 50 Cent, et cetera, right? Or it was really popular at the time, but I couldn't really relate to his music. Uh, but then when people started mm-hmm. to make waves like the Kanye Wests and even like, you know, the Drakes or whoever, I'm like, oh, this is a lane of people I can relate to. Right. We're not these, you know, we're not from I'm not from an inner city hood environment. Uh, and then, you know, people from like Gambino, it's more suburban where I'm like, OK, I can listen to this because now they speak in my language and the things they go through are things that I've went to through. So I think it it adds more of us into that conversation uh, because the majority of us mm-hmm. are not not gangbanging and not selling drugs. Um, and so that's just not going to fit a lot of the folk, a lot of the black folk who are not in those categories. So I think there's value to that. All that's right. Great. Well, good talking to y'all and uh, we will talk to you later. And as always continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.